this is another Vicky uh, session, Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement, which holds these Zoom discussions to keep us aware of political issues and the important issues of our times so that we can think to together about how to get out of this mm. fix, I think, that we're in. Um, and tonight is sort of a continuation of the discussion of the U.S. Constitution and how it applies to the current situation. There are many people who are now beginning to protest all around the country about the shutdown and the shutdown, uh, the lockup in their houses and also the denial of certain civil liberties. And the second part of the discussion is also about the economy and what kind of an effect that this um, practice, this shutdown has caused to the economy and what kind of, um, how we might recover. And then the third, I guess, is that we're gonna have a community discussion about how the pandemic has affected both. And I wanted to have start with Jared, who does have a lot of opinions about the constitution. However, he is also a professor at Vermont Law School and teaches there and, and teaches about the constitution. Okay, so there's Jared to, have, to give us his thoughts. And then I believe Robin wants to talk a little bit about the economy after that. Is that right, Robin? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay, all right, Jared. Great. Yeah, thanks. Good, good to see everybody again. Um, so what I'm going to try to do with my, you know, uh, discussion, presentation, as it were, is talk about constitutional issues, possible constitutional challenges to the existing um, uh, stay at home orders at the, at the state and local level. Um, that I've seen cropping up around the country. Um, I don't have an answer as to whether or not these, this litigation under these particular constitutional provisions is gonna be successful in the long run, but you're starting to see them percolate up. And so I wanna sort of walk through ones that I think are particularly relevant to the economics of what's going on in the country um, and sort of walk through what the courts have historically done in terms of interpreting challenges to um, uh, the, the diminution of, of, of liberty interests uh, in the context of public health emergencies and not. Um, because I think we can get some, some uh, information from looking at those cases and, and these issues. So the issues I'm, I'm gonna cover uh, here briefly are the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. Um, I'll touch briefly on Privileges and Immunities Clause and how that intersects. Um, uh, and then Due Process and Takings uh, Clause of the U.S. Constitution. Because I think all of those go to sort of the economics of this and that intersection between the Constitution and the economics. So, Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause is a part of the U.S. Constitution that gives the federal government, uh, as the US Supreme Court's interpreted it, the power um, to pass laws on matters affecting interstate commerce, commerce between states, and potentially preempting, in other words, um, overruling state laws on matters that impact interstate commerce. And so it's really a restraint on state action. Uh, on the state's ability to adopt rules, regulations, and laws that unduly burden this interstate commerce. Um, in looking at the laws in the, that exist at the federal level, sort of this has federal law preempted state laws, it's not apparent to me that Congress has tried to pass any laws that preempt states' actions with respect to coronavirus. Um, uh, so I haven't, there's no federal laws that, that Congress has passed to preempt governors, whether it's Scott or any other governor, in doing what they're doing. So I don't think that preemption issue in the context of the Commerce Clause really applies here. Um, however, the judiciary, the Supreme Court included, has interpreted the Commerce Clause to invalidate state actions that unduly burden interstate commerce. And that's particularly true when we're talking about state laws or regulations that um, sort of smack of economic protectionism. Uh, so when states pass laws to protect workers in their state or to provide economic benefits only to members of residents of that state, the, co the, the courts tend to look very critically at those. 
But ultimately, in order to be successful, if there were a Commerce Clause challenge to, say, Governor Scott's uh, uh, executive orders, the stay-at-home orders that he's applying and that the, the local governments are applying as well, including here in Burlington, uh, a challenger would have to show first that there has been state action that impedes interstate commerce. And I think the orders here clearly do that, um, whether it's the stay-at-home orders, whether it's the ban on visitors from quote unquote hot spots, um, clearly there is a, 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 an impediment to interstate commerce. The second step that the courts have looked at in the context of commerce clause challenges is to sort of characterize the nature of the, of the restriction. Um, uh, so for example, when states regulate modes of transportation, such as regulations of the size of a semi truck or the length of a train that can come into a particular state. The courts have generally deferred to those state laws as long as the states can show they have a real safety interest at stake. Courts have struck down laws like that if they find that the safety benefit that the state's professing is slight, dubious, or uh, illusory. So to the extent that there were a challenge, the state would have to show, and it's a substantial burden, that the state has, the state would have to show um, that the safety interest at stake is not slight, dubious, or illusory. Uh, otherwise, it's possible that uh, that part of the Commerce Clause provision would fall in favor of the of the uh, the challenger. You know, here uh, again, um, while it hasn't been tested throughout the court systems yet, um, there do seem to be obviously safety considerations. Um, that the court is unlikely to find slight or dubious. Um, ultimately, I think uh, what you're going to be seeing as these cases percolate through the court systems is what sort of evidence can states marshal to show uh, that, that the safety concerns are legitimate, that they're not slight, that they're not dubious. Um, those transportation case safety cases that I talked about um, that have typically been upheld by the courts haven't been upheld if they appear to discriminate between um, uh, uh, residents and non-residents. And in this case, Governor Scott's order does do that. So I think that's another open question. How does that facial discrimination, in other words, discrimination based on the language of the order, uh, factor in here? And to the extent that it is discriminatory, then the courts will typically apply what's called the strictest form of scrutiny, strict scrutiny, uh, which makes it even harder for the state to show um, that it's got a, a, a law that is narrowly tailored and that there's no less restrictive alternatives. Um, so for example, there's a case from my home state of Maine that's perhaps relevant here, although not directly on point because we're in uncharted territory. It's called Maine v. Taylor. And in that case, the US Supreme Court upheld an import ban on live bait fish into Maine. And the reason for that was that the court was convinced by the state presenting data that the movement of bait fish into Maine posed a significant threat of parasites of all things that could damage Maine's unique fisheries. Uh, and the court also said that so Maine had a substantial interest or, uh, and that the, they lacked less restrictive means other than this blanket ban. Um, so states have, the court has given states some leeway in that context. Um, Could I just interrupt and welcome sure. the uh, two new people to, to the call? Uh, Linda Lazarowski. Yeah, good to see you. Hi. And uh, Randy Koch, has he come on yet or you have to l let him on? Beth, I think. Anyway, uh, so uh, Jared is uh, giving a, a presentation concerning the Constitution, and then we'll move on to the economy and, and other things. Yeah, so I was just chatting a little bit about a possible Commerce Clause challenge, and you are starting to see some of these pop up across the country to uh, executive orders by governors. Um, so again, sort of reading the tea leaves here, uh, the governor's order doesn't on its face contain evidence of an attempt to give Vermont residents an unfair uh, economic advantage. So that militates in favor of the state. Um, and certainly if protecting local fisheries from out-of-state parasites can justify 
impeding, say, the bait fish industry, uh, then one could certainly argue that slowing the spread of COVID uh, can justify impeding the travel industry. Um, and to the extent Vermont could present evidence that it lacks a reliable mechanism uh, for identifying you know, carriers of the virus, they could argue that there's no adequate alternative means to prevent it. Um, so I don't think these claims are, are frivolous. Uh, I think it's ultimately, they're ultimately gonna turn on what sort of evidence the states that are challenged in can marshal um, to show that there is a substantial, A, there's a substantial reason uh, and B, that, um, uh, you know, essentially they can justify the action and um, that they have no Brandy. adequate alternative approach. And if they can do that, Commerce Clause challenges are going to be, uh, I think, a steep uphill battle for challengers um, of the, of the uh, of stay-at-home orders that the governors have issued. Um, so that's Commerce Clause. Privileges and Immunities Clause I think is perhaps a little bit more interesting in the context of what Vermont's done. And the Privilege and Immunities Clause is basically language in the Constitution that says uh, that citizens of one state should be afforded the same privileges and immunities in other states. And it was adopted as part of the Constitution uh, long ago, basically on the premise that if states start discriminating against non-residents, people from other states, it's going to create friction between the states and the, the union will will uh, will collapse under that. And so the Privileged and Immunities Clause is meant to stop that from happening. Some sort of good examples of what the Privileged and Immunities Clause means uh, is, say, for example, um, your driver, your Vermont driver's license is valid in California. Uh, a judicial order in the state of Vermont is valid in Texas. Um, that's what we mean by privileges and immunities, that we give credence to the, the rules, laws, et cetera, of other states. Um, and so laws or rules that appear to discriminate based on one's residency uh, can be challenged under the Privileges and Immunities Clause. <clears throat> and I think if you look at particularly certain provisions of the governor's order with respect to visitors and visitors from hotspots, it does seem to imply that um, non-residents, visitors, um, are prevented from enjoying what's been deemed a constitutional right the free ingress and egress of between states, interstate travel, uh, based on their residency. And that's gonna be highly suspect to a court in determining whether or not uh, a particular provision is constitutional, that discrimination based on one's residency. Um, ultimately, the court's gonna get into a balancing test uh, and determine whether or not there's less restrictive means for the states to accomplish the, the goals that they set out, which ostensibly are to prevent people from hot spots coming in and infecting people in Vermont. But the courts are gonna look much more critically at that particular part of the, the, the governor's orders because of that discrimination based on one's status as a non-Vermont resident. Um, so I think that's an interesting one. We'll see where that all leads. Uh, I'm not aware of any challenges to this in Vermont, um, but certainly other in other states, um, it appears to be happening. Um, and by the way, from an economic perspective, that privilege and immunities clause does um, uh, include um, rights of eco economic rights, the ability to conduct business in a state. Uh, uh, if, you, if a Vermonter can do it, but a non-resident can't, um, that's certainly something that a court would look critically at in terms of privileges and immunities. So there is an economic uh, impact there. Um, another area that uh, courts might look at is the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, that can be used to challenge state actions that are discriminatory. Um, and in some instances, laws have been struck down that impose um, residency requirements, particularly durational residency requirements that in order to qualify, say, for uh, a public benefit, you have to have lived in the state for a certain amount of time. Courts have struck that down and struck those down in certain circumstances based on equal protection. Um, uh, but I think probably an equal protection claim is going to be a difficult one uh, for challengers because you really do have to show invidious discrimination based on uh, a protected class. So it certainly if there was uh, discrimination based on one's race, 
residency can, can qualify, gender, um, et cetera, the nationality, then uh, that would be a different story. That doesn't, as far as I can tell, seem to be happening. But if the data showed that, that people of certain races were being impacted by these orders in a different way, uh, then there may very well be equal protection issues that courts would be interested in looking at. Um, briefly, due process. Um, so the doctrine of substantive due process uh, essentially requires, um, and due process is the idea that um, you can't have liberty right, liberty interests is taken away without proper process, without proper protections. And so the doctrine of substantive due process typically requires that the government satisfy um, that strict scrutiny test before they can deprive a person of a fundamental liberty or property right. Uh, and the court, the Supreme Court has recognized that right to travel as protected by the 14th Amendment's concept of liberty. Um, and so to the extent that the right to travel between states or within states is impacted, um, you, you are starting to see, and I think you probably will see more of these challenges under that substantive due process argument. On the other hand, the court has recognized that the right to travel does not prohibit the government from quarantining, um, and this is a quote, areas ravaged by flood, fire, or pestilence when it can be demonstrated that unlimited travel to the area would directly and materially interfere with the safety and welfare of the area or the nation as a whole. So the court sort of has on, on the one hand this, mm -hmm. on the other hand that, um, but ultimately the state would have the burden of showing that this, this restriction on travel is because of being ravaged by a flood, fire, or pestilence, and that, um, uh, that the, 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 the restriction on travel to a particular area would directly and materially interfere with the safety and welfare of that area. So the state would have a burden of proof, in, in, I guess you could say, in terms of demonstrating that that is the case before a court would just say, okay, this passes substantive due process. Um, and so ultimately, if that's the case, then to satisfy that legal test, any restriction on the right to travel must be necessary to promote a compelling state interest. So necessary to promote a compelling state interest. Um, and, and so I think that's the analysis that a court would look at. And whether or not, um, say for example, banning visitors from hotspots is necessary to protect the lives of Vermonters, uh, you know, I think it's gonna turn on what sort of evidence the state has um, one could certainly argue that the visitor ban itself doesn't seem to protect uh, the lives of Vermonters because a, a Vermonter coming from a hot spot would be just as likely to be a health risk as a visitor coming from a hot spot. So it, it doesn't seem as though the visitor's prohibition is necessary. And so it may be that in light of that and that right to interstate travel, there might be due process issues as well. Eric, could we, could we, could you stop a moment and see if there are any questions? Sure. Anybody have any questions or thoughts? I do. Grant does. Yeah. I, I find I'm not clear on the difference between commerce and travel. Yeah. Commerce is to have the actual exchange of goods, but you have to travel to do that. And it's traveling simply on vacation or is there even a distinction? Yeah. Yeah. So good, good question. Um, so th there are sort of separate rights. So there is a fundamental right to interstate travel that is protected aside from commerce. So you do have a fundamental right to interstate, com uh, interstate travel. The commerce clause piece is more of a restraint on state action. So a state can't pass a law that burdens interstate commerce, unduly burdens interstate commerce. So for example, a lot of the civil rights laws that were passed um, that you know, prevented states from having um, separate uh, hotels for African-Americans and separate hotels for white people, those were struck down. Uh, and the, part of the, uh, the reason they were struck down is because the courts concluded that the federal government under the Commerce Clause has the power to restrict, um, uh, has the power to restrict uh, 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 prevent hotels, for example, from discriminating mm -hmm. under the Commerce Clause, and that states can't have laws that violate that Commerce Clause provision. So if the, if the courts found that the ban on visitors to Vermont 
unduly burdens interstate commerce, the governor's order could be struck down on those grounds. Alternatively, if the courts found that um, the state violated folks' um, it, right to interstate travel, then the, then the governor's order could be struck down on those grounds. So they're sort of separate sides of a, of a, of a similar issue, if that makes any sense. Thank you, yeah. yes, thank you. Yeah, now Robin, Robin has a question. Yeah, yeah, so um, uh, uh, this is basically a theor theoretical discussion because, or tell me, has any state actually put up barriers for other people to come into the state and enforce it. It's one thing to say, we don't want people to go here or there, but are, are there any states where there are, you know, barriers and policemen at boundaries saying you cannot come in or you have to jump through this hoop before you can come in? Has that happened yet? Yeah, yeah, good, good, good question. Uh, I mean, I've heard anecdotally and through the news of checkpoints, checking people, uh, their license plates, um, which certainly would slow the movement of interstate commerce, interstate travel. I'm not sure of anybody being, uh, and maybe others have heard uh, of, of instances where people have actually, this has been enforced, they say you may not come into Vermont or you may not come into to Massachusetts. But the one point I would make is uh, with constitutional rights, you don't usually have to actually wait till enforcement has happened. So if the government passes a law and you can show that you are uh, uh, very likely to be impacted by that, you can challenge that law even if it hasn't been, um, you'd have what we call standing, even if it hasn't been enforced against you. So for example, if the state of Vermont passed a law that said, um, you know, uh, individuals of African-American descent may no longer vote. An African American wouldn't have to wait until they've gone to the polling place and been told they can't vote in order to challenge that law. They'd have standing to challenge that law. I don't know if others have heard of instances where it's actually been enforced. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's enforced, but I did hear, maybe again anecdotally, that the state of Rhode Island was requiring anybody with certain license plates that entered that that person would be quarantined for 14 days. Well, in Vermont, that's the same as Vermont. Yeah, so that is not an undue burden, you don't think, on a, on a... Yeah, I, I, think, I think if somebody wanted to, they wouldn't have to be, you know, arrested or fined in order to challenge that, um, that uh, in court, um, because it, it's, the, it's sort of a prior restraint principle yeah. um, that you can't um, restrain people from engaging in constitutional activity, and they don't have to wait till they've actually been restrained in order to, to challenge the the law or regulation. I don't think, I think all of these constitutional issues we talked about are probably gonna be um, uh, unlikely to succeed at this point in time in the courts. And we touched on this, I guess, last time, a few weeks ago. Um, but um, as we get further and further along and as more and more states open up and as the federal government changes its, its uh, stance on things, um, then you might see instances, in, and in fact, Attorney General Barr was talking about this ah, yesterday, yeah, where see. the Department of Justice may itself get involved. So if right, someone right. sues for not being able to go to a, a, a religious ceremony and says that their religious rights have been violated, the Department of Justice under Attorney General Barr is talking about potentially joining those lawsuits. Right, I um, saw that. Is that yeah, a, so, is that, so the, the, the climate could change very rapidly, right. in other well, words, I, is what I'm saying. I think it's going to, uh, especially if Attorney General Barr gets involved. And he did, he said it. He said that the states can't pass uh, any kind of restrictions that violate the Constitution, and that if they do, that the Attorney General will get involved in making him stop, which I, right. thought, was really, which I thought was very interesting, you know? Yeah, yeah, and I think, again, if you're a court trying to decide these issues, all of a sudden having the attorney general involved, I think does change the dynamic because traditionally courts are gonna be very deferential and they have been to states uh, managing public health crises. If all of a sudden the federal government comes in and says, well, no, the state shouldn't be doing this, then um, you know, it, 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 it provides the court with a, a, an alternative route. You know, Again, every, reasonable minds can disagree whether that's good or not, but I, I'm saying from purely 
analytical perspective, I think if the attorney general gets involved, that does change the overall demeanor of any challenges right. you know, to, to this. The one other place that I'd highlight, and I think this is certainly an economic issue, is, is um, the takings clause of the U.S. Constitution. Um, and what the takings clause essentially boils down to um, is, and you might have heard of it in the context of eminent domain. Right, so, right. you know, the city or the state or the federal government have the power to seize private property for, you know, public good. Um, and um, and if if and 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 there and the people that have property seized are due reasonable compensation for that seizure. Uh, and I think you, you I, I feel like I've read uh, in the news recently, I haven't reviewed cases, but instances where folks are saying um, that, you know, they, for example, own a hotel or a restaurant. Um, and because of the stay at home orders, they're saying that the government has effectively taken their property, that there's no, um, uh, they have no alternative for economic benefit of that property that they used to have. Um, and that the, the government is essentially it, it, it committed a taking without compensation. Um, uh, and I think, I think you're likely to see some of those cropping up. Um, the basic analysis of a taking uh, is, is uh, and I, you can look at it through the context of the Vermont uh, orders, but let's just to say, assume for the sake of argument that a court finds that say, a non-resident has a property interest in accessing their private property. Um, be, but they're not allowed to because they're a visitor from a hot spot, or they're not allowed to run their business because they are under a stay-at-home order. Um, my my sense is that the court is at this stage probably going to subject the government um, uh, to the what we call government-friendly regulatory takings analysis from a case called Penn Central, um, and I think this is because um, it's what the government is doing here is best described as restricting the use of property during a pandemic. Um, and so it doesn't fit any of these specific categories that we call per se takings, which trigger automatically the requirement of, of recompense. Um, the, the order in Vermont anyway, uh, it doesn't, it's not a direct appropriation of property because mm -hmm. the government isn't actually seizing people's property for its own use. Uh, it's not a physical occupation of property, which is another category of per se taking, because the government's not entering or authorizing a third party to enter a resident's private property. Um, it's not what we call a Lucas taking, and Lucas is a Supreme Court case that we, we've taken that name from, um, because it doesn't provide a non prevent a non-resident from all economic uh, value of their property. Although certainly, I think. One could argue if you're running a restaurant on Church Street that you can't run anymore, you could certainly argue that perhaps this is um, depriving me of all economic value of the property. On the other hand, you can sell to-go food. Um, so it literally gets down to that level of minutia um, where the government would probably argue, well, we haven't taken away all economic value of your property. You can sell to-go food even if you can't have people come into your, to your restaurant. Um, so I think a takings... Uh, clause argument is an interesting one. Whether it would be successful, I think, you know, remains to be seen, I suppose. One other area that I think is interesting, and I've sort of just started exploring this, um, so I don't have it entirely developed in my own head, but you've heard um, the president say, um, or be, been very hesitant to use the emergency, I think it's the Emergency Production Act that yeah. allows him to essentially yeah. take over production of an industry right. like happened in, uh, I think, World War II. Yeah, um, with President Truman, perfect. didn't he take over the coal companies steel. or something? Steel, what? steel, yeah, steel, the steel seizure yeah. cases. Yeah. yeah, so President has been hesitant to do that, and a lot of governors have have been saying, "Well, we can't. We might have enough tests now, but we don't have the chemical reagents, and we don't have the swabs." And and some of them have been calling on the president, and I think maybe he has done now used it in some instances, but calling on the president to use. Um, that act to essentially take over the means of production. Um, and I started thinking about, do the governors already have that power? Um, because the governors were saying, we don't have, in fact, it was Cuomo said, I don't have the power to do that under existing state law. We need you, President Trump, to do it. And I started looking into, at least in Vermont, what powers does the Vermont governor have? 
with that with respect to that so in other words could the vermont could governor scott actually to the extent we have any swab companies in vermont uh, take over the means of production through a taking through eminent domain and i feel like and i can read you guys some of the language from the law uh, he probably actually does um, again you, we can either like that or not but under 20 vsa uh, section 11 which is the gov listing of the governor's emergency powers passed by the legislature uh, it says that the governor has the power to quote seize take or condemn property for the protection of the public or at the request of the president or his or her authorized representatives including all means of transportation all stocks of fuel whatever nature food clothing equipment materials medicines and all supplies facilities including businesses and plants um, and to make compensation for the property so seized. Um, so I feel like based on that statute, uh, and to the extent other states have those as well, that they're being a bit in disingenuous in saying we have to have the president do this. Um, uh, while I haven't followed all of the possible rabbit holes on this, um, in reading that statute, it certainly seems to me that Governor Scott could make a pretty strong argument that he already has the authority if he wanted to uh, to act to take over, say, a swab plant in uh, in Burlington down on Church Street. But isn't the argument that not just for the president to take over the plant, but to coordinate it? That's what people seem to be asking for, to yeah. the central office of coordination. And he seems to refuse to do that, or he only wants to give to his friends. I don't who, know. Who's, who's he? Trump, you mean? Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, I think that's a fair point, Robin. But again, I would look at, I mean, I think I think Governor Scott, ostensibly anyway, and I don't know if this these particular provisions have ever been tested in the Vermont Supreme Court, but it says to seize, take, or condemn property for the protection of public interest and includes medicines, materials, um, and to make compensation. So I, I think conceivably he could seize if there was a swab plant in Burlington, he could seize it. He'd have to make compensation to the owner, um, uh, but seize it and manage the business as as he sees fit. Um, uh, and that, that there's nothing in there. And if you read a little bit further, it does go on to say, um, you know, in, in the case the property is taken for temporary use, the governor at the time of the taking shall fix the amount of compensation to be paid therefore. Um, and in case such property shall return to the owner in a damaged condition or shall not be returned to the owner, the governor shall fix the amount of compensation. So it does give, as far as I can tell, the governor pretty broad authority to um, uh, determine, you know, what fair and just compensation is um, and to take over uh, a private property along those lines. Again, I, I mean, didn't that happen in the urban renewal uh, projects? In the right, yeah. So if the if the if the, if the mayor can or the governor yeah. can seize property and turn it into a bike path, yeah, uh, it seems that probably they could seize uh, property in the form of a business uh, that's producing, say, um, you know, I don't know, socks, and yeah. turn it into a yeah. uh, a mask factory. Well, didn't uh, didn't Trump actually thing. do that actually recently? I mean, he didn't. He well, Trump order did do it with 3M, and maybe others know yeah, better. Right, but I think right. he did do it with 3M for uh, masks. So, yeah. And I read somewhere that he maybe had done it now for swabs, um, but I could be incorrect on that. Okay. But it's just an interesting side note, you know. And I think it's obviously massive economic implications uh, anytime you have the government uh, taking over private property in that manner. Um, and I think it's interesting, from my perspective, in my sort of background, um, we, ought, we, you know, we, we point to the United States as this pinnacle of, of private capitalism, and we critique other countries that in times of necessity have nationalized public property. And yet, in, in black and white, in our own laws, we have that power described to the state. Um, and, and, um, and so I think that's, a, that's an interesting, uh, an interesting sort of side note to to all of this. Well, are other states being asked? I mean, why it, it, is this happening in other states? Yeah. We have a lot more resources than Vermont to mm -hmm. do those kinds of things that we need. Yeah, I, I yeah. I'm not familiar with the, the, 
the emergency powers of governors in other, other states, to be totally frank. Okay, um, so this is a Vermont. This is a Vermont law, oh. but my, my guess, I mean, Vermont doesn't make these things up in whole cloth. I mean, my right. guess is many other states have similar provisions. Yeah. Um, although I'll admit I haven't, I haven't looked at them, um, but many other states likely have similar provisions. Okay, any other questions? Could we welcome the other, the new two yeah. people who came in? Um, I don't know what happened to him. Mark Estrin was here for a while. Yeah. He's there. He yeah. is. Sally. Oh, Sally. 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 Right, yeah. there's Mark. And yeah. Jack La 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 Lazarotti. There he is in the background. Yep. Always a bridesmaid, never a bride, Jack, right? Where is he? Anyway, hello, hi. All right, anybody have any other questions? Robin wanted to say a few words about the economy, is correct? Jared is Jared, are you finished? Yeah, no, that was great. And I apologize for droning on for five minutes. I hope it was at least somewhat interesting and informative. Yeah. It was, and it, it certainly addressed issues other than the Bill of Rights, which are also uh, part of the demonstrators who were in Montpelier today are demonstrating not about the Commerce Clause, but about the Bill of Rights and about uh, the, the, the shutdown, which has not allowed them to, as they argued, to assemble or to speak freely. Um, that's part of the Bill of Rights. With Jared, I think you were talking about was the actual body of the um, Constitution more than the amendments. The Bill of Rights are amendments, right? Yes, that's correct. Right. Yep. Um, okay, anybody else? Robin? Yeah, okay. Well, over the weekend, I uh, read an article that uh, really got me depressed. <laughs> uh, it's by um, Umir Hake, H-A-Q-U-E. He's a um, economist in Europe, uh, or in England, I believe, but coming from Asia, probably um, India or Pakistan. And his article was, We're Watching an Economy Die. Uh, I mm -hmm. mean, his point is that this uh, gigantic um, sort of shock wave of unemployment uh, will is really what he calls just the crest of the tsunami, but we have not yet felt the after effects of that. Right. And that it will bring a huge amount of destruction behind it. Uh, he calls it a chain reaction of ruin. And part of it is uh, just a lack of confidence that someone who had a little business going and he, he uses an example, a micro brewery. Well, you, you know, all these micro breweries in Vermont, of course, I don't drink beer, but uh, th they're kind of a, an, an extravagance if you look at a pared down economy because there's plenty of other beers to drink but there he's able these micro breweries are able to find a niche in the economy and they hire people and so on and now being closed down they are going to have a really hard time getting going again and their um former employees may have found other work um uh this guy predicts a lasting decline in entrepreneurship yeah, aye, aye, aye. The, the risks um are will be multiplying out of control for um for someone trying to get back into starting a business and there will be an explosion in gig work yeah. and um i heard it on the radio the other day about how people make money now picking up food at the grocery, orders that have been put into the grocery to deliver food somewhere. They spend their time in their car in the parking lot of the grocery store and they, on their app, they pick up the order and who grabs it first? It's, it's, uh, it's, it sounds really, really uh, uh, <laughs> a very fragile edge to be on. Um, uh, uh, and to try to think you could make a life out of something like that. This, um, Hauke says, unemployment in America isn't like other countries. Because of America's ruinous, obsolete social contract, 
most forms of social insurance and benefits are tied to jobs. As people lose whatever jobs they had, the effects are therefore going to be catastrophic. They're not just going to lose their incomes, they're going to lose their health care, retirement, child care, and so forth. So he has, uh, you know, really a very dire view of, of the future. Um, he goes on to say that uh, we know that the economy has been divided into a kind of caste system, and that's being reinforced. And at the top are the owners of techno capital. In other words, the people in charge of those huge companies that everyone is relying on, like Amazon and Google and so on, they are getting richer and richer. They're the tiny class of mega billionaires, but uh, below that are um, all everyone else and what he calls them uh, the abandoned working class. Life in this class is about technological ne neo serfdom. Yeah. App, the platform, oh. the algorithm oh. is your boss. So uh, this oh, yeah. is. Um, that that um, all the gains of this um, of this terrible crisis we're going through will be taken up by the mega rich. Uh, you know, I, you can look it up if you want. We're watching an economy die, but uh, that com uh, combined with an article from uh, Jared Diamond. Yeah looking into the um, environmental crises and saying, you know, it's that the whole planet will grind to a halt by 20, 2050. I mean, and I, I believe this is true. You know, this means that our kids and our grandkids and our friends and whatever, uh, you know, I, they're not going to have, how will they live? Bob, and I wanted to ask you, the author of this article, how do you spell his last name? Is it H-A-Y-E-K, Hayek? H-A-Q-U-E. -E. Uh, Does anyone else know of him? Uh, you uh, other bright people on this call? <laughs> uh, but I do know that that has been my concern since the beginning of the pandemic is basically, um, well, it's, it's basically, I've never feared the virus as much as I feared the economic co collapse. And I see it in exactly the same way that there, there is now and there will be further economic collapse and the rich will benefit as they always do. And everybody else will be put in a position of unemployment. And I don't think that we are, we have given enough attention to that. I don't, at all. I mean, the constant, in fact, it's become rather a partisan issue right now, hasn't it? With the president um, and many of the Republican governors saying we have to open up the economy. Now, if they open up the economy, I'm sure it's going to benefit the rich, as that always does. But it will get people back to work. And if we don't do that, if we don't get people back to work, then what the hell are they going to do? I mean, they're going to sit in their houses and they're eventually going to starve. And, that, and that's what I think is going to happen. Like I was very concerned um, yesterday when the CDC announces that they're uh, that they believe that there'll be another huge coronavirus epidemic in the fall. What are we going to do? Go through this until what, 2021? There's no way that the economy, mm -hmm. I don't think the, reco the economy has much chance of recovering right now even. I think Randy has something to say. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. also Kurt. Okay, Randy? No, I didn't have anything to say. I'm just sitting here taking oh, it all in. I thought you were waving your hand or something. Okay, well, Kurt. A false gesture. Yeah. <laughs> Kurt. Yeah. Uh, no, just to add to Robin's uh, point and Sandy's point with respect to second and third waves, when the, econ when the economy does open, don't expect a large mad rush. I know. All to, right. the, to the airlines, to the restaurants, to the stores. I mean, there will be a certain uh, contingent of the population that do that. However, it's not going to be in the numbers to sustain the economy that we had before. Uh, and that's going to take some time before there is adequate trust uh, 
in, in the minds of a lot of people before they re-engage as they did in the past. So that's going to have a strong uh, impact on the economy also beyond the current situation that we're in. Anybody else? Jared is, Jared's got his hand up. Go ahead, Jared. Yeah, I was just, and also to sort of piggyback off all of these points, I mean, I, I keep coming back to this, this, at least in my head, and I'm not a, an economist, but uh, look, so much of our economic growth in the past 30, 40, maybe 50 years has been built on debt. Um, and, and I'm not saying government debt exclusively, personal debt. Uh, I mean, if you look at the net worth of the average American now, I think it might even be negative uh, uh, or very close there too. And it's only uh, been exponentially growing. We talk about student loan costs that we're burdening young, young people with. Um, and so a, a big fear to me is um, as soon as people can't, can no longer service their debt, we're talking about 22 million people without jobs over the course of a month. Um, oh, yeah. That very quickly, and, and that very quickly is going to have massive impacts on the consumerism in our society yeah. and our, our, our economy is 70% based on uh, the, the consumer economy. Um, and so I feel like, yes, I think, Sandy, you're very right. When we open the economy, it's probably going to benefit the rich, but this could be so catastrophic right. um, in light of the impact on the consumer economy that this may very well trickle up even to the, the, the lords of, uh, of, uh, of our economy, the Boeings, the, the, the airlines, the, the hotel tycoons. Um, I, you know, I think what are you saying? Do you think that, that the, the economy will not recover? I don't I think mean, so, actually. I don't think so. I don't so. know. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I, just, I, don't. I just don't know. It's, it's a scary proposition, uh -huh. um, but, mm -hmm. but it's, it's certainly going to be a long time. Randy does have, Randy? It seems to me that, that, that it's worth noting that there are really two economies. There's a finance economy and there's the productive economy. And if the productive economy craps out, then there's no more food for, for one thing. But if the financial economy craps out, they can, they can correct that with a few keystrokes in okay. five minutes and create enough money to take care of it. Yeah, what, what I think what you're saying is it, Randy, that the government can simply transfer funds into bank accounts by uh, by uh, by a computer. Doesn't, it's, but it's, it's not real money. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm I'm saying it's real money in terms of the yeah. financial economy. Right. I, mean, I, think, can, I think Mark has a question too. Yeah. Yeah. There's a third economy. Which is? It's the defense economy. Yeah. The war, the war economy. Exactly. And whenever anybody right. says there's no money they are bracketing the trillions of dollars that are committed to um, war making. And right. I think we have to keep that in mind as a target for um, bleeding into the economy some, some uh, uh, funds that people need and keep, recognize the, uh, the enormous storage that's in there. I'm not exactly sure what you mean. You mean that that money will be reduced? Yeah, that, that our demands in the uh, problematical condition that we're heading for, that Kurt has spoken to and, and um, um, Randy has spoken to and J Jared has spoken to, that there is this huge, huge pot of money. Yeah. yeah. Right? And we need to know that it's there and we need to aim at getting at it and mm -hmm. not just bracket it. Right, no, I agree. Mm -hmm. Agree. Um, however, did you also see today that uh, there might be collision with Iran and the seas? I mean, those are all the things. And that, of course, is with our shipping and our ships in that area of the world. I mean, his plan, Trump's plans for war have not diminished in all of this, right? And that is what Mark is saying. That's a huge part of our budget. So that's not collapsing, but that's not, that, doesn't, that doesn't create a decent economy either, right? It's a war economy. It's the industrial, it's the military industrial complex that gets all of our money, exact, right? And that is not available to anybody. Okay, Ian wants to speak. Yeah, um, Ian. 
Yeah, I think the article that Robin was referring to and, and quoting from was drawing attention to something that's very um, different in our lifetimes. During our lifetimes is the increase in inequality. You know, we're living in an era now of huge, uh, un almost unprecedented in our lifetime income and wealth inequality. Um, and and I, I want to connect this to the, um, the positions that Jared was explaining about state law and federal law, but in this case, um, dealing with the economic consequences of this, um, this virus it is, is currently placing huge demands on, on uh, federal and state budgets. And the federal government is dishing out money and, and to individuals and to corporations and has the ability to raise uh, credit by a number of means and to pressurize the banks and and uh, and print money ultimately maybe but the state state of Vermont states in general state of Vermont uh, has very limited options for raising money and so if we connect the need to raise money with the wealth inequality this argues for uh, you know tax the tax the rich a real substantial change in the in tax law that would provide the resources to handle these extraordinary conditions um, so, you know, is this is this in the um, in our future? Is this uh, is the need for a reorganization of of tax law and, and the state budget going to happen, is, or is, are we going to brush that one under the carpet somehow? Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? You got to remember that Congress passes tax law; they're not going to do it, Robin. Robin. Yeah, um, Sandy and I had a little set to this afternoon about Sweden, and um, so I looked up what is happening there, and uh, she's largely right. I mean, it's it's really interesting. They have um, what they call a voluntary lockdown. I mean, uh, they want people to be locked down. Well, it's I mean, it's like here in most places, there is not really gendarmes out there arresting you uh except maybe young kids in in um, playgrounds uh but anyway they they have a voluntary lockdown they want to create what they call a livable lockdown and um they have a broader view of of health uh including mental health like the impact that this stringent lockdown is having on people living in places where there's no park to go to and so on. I mean, I think people are being driven cr crazy um, in some places. So, but I mean, I think Sweden is a unique uh, nation and um, they have uh, they have good health care and they expect people to be responsible, but they have had 2,000 deaths, just about 2,000 deaths, which is a lot more than Denmark, according to the chart I was looking at, and I don't know the population difference, but it's sort of as if they're saying, we're going, we know that we'll have people dying from the virus, but we expect people to to uh, sort of discipline themselves, and they have been, although they yeah. face a number of deaths. But they did no, not crash the economy, and that, that's what's so curious here. They left bars and restaurants open, and they made it reasonable. You still, you have to go to a bar in uh, Sweden, and you have to stand at, you can't stand at the bar, you have to be at a table, and you have to distance yourself, and similarly in restaurants. So the economy no. did not collapse. This one did. This one, the economy, and I don't see it ever really recovering. And in a lot of ways, I see that as a collapse of civilization. So it's great. It's important to economy, but but it, it's important to note that Sweden is a member of the Europe, Europe a member country right. of the European Union, and uh, I think this makes a really interesting comparison. That uh, as, as far as I can see, the countries of the European Union have a lot of leeway to um, to make their own regulations restrictions on population and so on, travel. Um, and, and in the States, we're seeing individual states saying, well, you know, this is a, this is a huge subcontinent with, with very different conditions in Georgia and in California and Vermont. So um, we, you know, states should 
be an, al allowed to make their own rules, their own regulations, independent of the federal government. Uh, it seems to me the European Union is already doing that. I don't know how the legal situation uh, uh, differs, but uh, I think you know it's a really interesting comparison, and it raises this question of of uh, can states that have very different conditions make craft their own uh, restrictions, regulations? Well, Trump has done that. He has said that. He has given it up to the states. And I think regardless of how we feel personally about Trump, it was a brilliant political move because now he can both blame the governors if it screws up and he can take credit if it doesn't screw up. And, you know, either way, he wins, right? He couldn't, he, I don't think either that he ever had the inclination to have a national shutdown. I don't think he ever really wanted to do that. Anyway, he is, as we all know, a capitalist. He does not want to have an economic collapse on his watch. I don't either, frankly. I don't want an economic collapse. But, but that to me is what has happened. And every day I go down to Burlington and I see dead streets, empty streets. It's just like, it's just like Blade Runner or something. It's science fiction. Yeah, yeah, to Ian's point um, about sort of the comparisons between the states and the, the member states of the EU, uh, I, think that's, I think that's an interesting one. And there's a, there's a series of US Supreme Court cases that have uh, given this authority to the states. Um, and so that's why I think we are gonna, we are seeing and will continue to see states take different approaches, opening up at different times, opening up in different ways because they are empowered by this series of US Supreme Court cases to do exactly that. And, and one of the, the leading cases on this front is a case, I'm probably gonna pronounce it wrong, Sandy and Grant can correct me, but it's, it's Compagnie Francaise. Uh, uh, yes, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah and it, the, the city of New Orleans. And that was a case in 1902 where uh, a boat full of Europeans um, on a boat from France uh, were trying to make port in 1902 in, in New Orleans and they were denied entry by the state of Louisiana by the New Orleans Health Board because of I think it was yellow fever some illness that was going around yeah. and and the and the and the, their the boat was essentially seized and the owner of the company sued the city and the state of Louisiana uh, on commerce clause grounds saying you're burdening interstate and international commerce and that's the purview of the federal government and the supreme court said no in the context of a public health emergency it's states that have the power to manage and decide what's right for their population um and and that's that's reiterating what the court had said before and has said since uh, in that in that context so okay any any other thoughts well, I, I think that the considerations of the economy are really, uh, at least that's been on my mind. So I guess so, that's what I'm asking. Is there any real chance of recovery and what does it mean if we're gonna recover? Are we even going to go back? Okay, there's another thought on my mind. I don't like the status quo. I don't particularly like the status quo that has existed forever in a, in a uh, capitalist economy. However, I believe that until business or until the economy opens, we're not also going to see any kind of political openings or any return to our civil liberties. Because in this current shutdown, unless we're out of our house and able to gather, unless we're able to assemble and form an opposition, I just don't think that there's going to be any opposition really that's very effective. Uh, today there was opposition to Jeb Spaulding's uh, uh, proposal, which I found very interesting. Those people, the, what? Who that somebody, was interesting. What? Randy? That was very interesting, yeah. It was really interesting because people were able to uh, push back and get the uh, state college systems uh, reformed or reopened for the fall. Um, it could have been a political ploy on Spalding's part, but he did yeah. seem to respond. Yeah. Sally said that. Sally said that. What do you think? He, he flatly denied it when he was asked. Of course, but of course, he, would, yes. he would deny it. Of course he would. <laughs> right? speak, speak closer, Sally. He flatly denied it. He was asked on the evening news as if, uh, if that had been a, a strategic move, and he flatly denied it. 
That's yeah, but part he, of the ploy. Yeah, but that's part of the ploy, as Grant said, right? Or do, what do you think, Sally? Yeah, well, I think it was very clever. I do think it was, it was clever, clever too. Clever. It worked. It was. It worked. It really did work. Exactly. And he seemed to. Res it appears that he responded to political pressure um, on from normal people, but I don't see that possibility of having that kind of pressure if everybody's locked down in their house. That's, I think, what worries me the most, especially within the city. I don't see any way that we can organize real opposition to the mayor in the next election, which I would like to see happen. But if we're locked up and unable to even communicate in groups, yeah. it's going to be very tough to do politics. I would just say, I think that all, all good points, Sandy. My, my, I mean, again, I'm not an economist, but my, my sort of take on it is, um, I think there will be no politics uh, and no real, um, you know, opposition. Again, yeah. we can differ on whether we think there should be opposition or not. That's fine, but I don't think there will be either way until the economic pain is really being felt. Until you can't get pork chops at the supermarket. Until you've got to, yeah. you know, you got to wait months for getting eggs. Um, and then I think people are going to start feeling this. And and thus far. You know, people have been out of work a couple weeks. You know, maybe they've started to get unemployment. Um, so that economic hit hasn't really, really, really been felt. But I think when we start, you know, if we do start seeing those sorts of shortages, uh, those sorts of experiences, then um, then I think there will be real political engagement. And you know, if you look at what came out of the Great Depression, um, certainly there's flawed pieces to it, but um, but sort of the progressive era that came out of that, uh, you know, is there space for for another societal realignment? Um, uh, I don't know, but but I think it's possible if we start seeing those sorts of economic impacts. Can I make a couple co comments about the last time that the United States uh, was involved in the Great Depression? But Ian, are you leaving? Is that what you said? I guess he's gone. He's gone. Um, in the last, people have said to me over and over, well, Franklin Roosevelt, he got us out of the last depression. That isn't quite true or accurate, I should say, um, by massive government spending um, and programs like the WPA Works Progress Administration and then also with the CCC and welfare, social security, all of that was started by, in 19, by 1936. And that did create what and it, what demand, it gave people who had little money, enough money to uh, reinvigorate the demand side of the economy, right? But- and, and there was a mental health component to it also, Sandy. Yeah. It gave people something to do, which- Yeah, 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 like my father. Yeah. My, my father was unemployed in 1928, and then he didn't really go back to full-time employment until it's an interesting date, 1941, is when he went back full-time, but he had a chance to work for the Works Progress Administration, and he was a singer, never had been a singer before. Anyway, so, but by 1938, if the, the unemployment rate in 1932 was like 25%, 25%, right? And then Franklin Roosevelt was elected, and he did have massive government spending. But even by 1938, the unemployment figure wasn't really recovered. He had to have massive government spending in order to get back to full employment. And that's why the date 1941 is so critical because that was the birth of the military industrial complex and permanent, permanent war. And that is what got the depression over. And that's what got people employed. So then after 1945, the same kind of economy was developed. And that was a permanent military industrial complex economy that we never went back to peacetime, in other words. After World War I, the United States did, but not after World War II. So it's been war that has kept this economy together for a very long time. And I, I, I don't want that kind of an economy, certainly. I just don't know how on earth that this crash is going to end. I, I, can't, I can't see it. Because although Trump is giving all this money, right? out to companies, but also a little bit to people. It's First of all, it's not going to be enough. And it's fiat money. There's no standard. There's no gold standard. He's just printing piles of dough. And I want to know what kind of effect that has on an economy. There's yeah, no backing to it. One. 
what? Kind of what? Fiat money, and there's no there's nothing to back up that money. Mark there's has no productivity. There's no nothing. What? Mark has a question. Is he gone, Mark? Yeah, no, I, I have to turn on my mic. Um, I want to take some issue with Sandy's notion that unless you can get out of the house, uh, you don't have a politics. Uh -huh. And I think what's on the screen in front of us right now right. is exactly right. uh, an example of a new development that we together with the understand, our understanding of the technology that's available have made happen and that what we need to be doing in these times when there are these conflicting things about you go out, you're asserting your rights, but uh -huh. you go out, you're also threatening other people's health. Uh, that that um, we need to think more about stuff exactly like this and how this can be developed into uh, its own version of political action. So for instance, just from, it, from my point of view, this hasn't made a big change for me because I'm a writer and a publisher and uh, my wife, uh, we have a publishing company uh, and we spend most of the day uh, in front of our machines and uh, making uh, texts available to people. And uh, so that hasn't changed much for us at all. And we, uh, you know, make a, like now, I'm making a public appearance without leaving the house, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots we can do without leaving the house. And I think as the uh, culture shifts, that of course also will contain education, how people teach each other and how people learn, how children are rel relate to their own uh, households with respect to uh, being part of their learning, not necessarily going off to school, uh, but uh, reintegrating, uh, being in a family with, with education. All of that stuff, can and will change and is changing and that we have to think of it not just as a deprivation but as an opportunity to develop new politics i do well, i'm the, i have i've done all this i just want to mention especially right. yeah. i agree yeah. sandy has sandy has modeled a lot of that stuff uh, um, yeah. uh about getting groups together we've we've several people on the screen here have been you know thinking about uh, Burlington College and replacing it with Vicky and and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Those are all available to us. So I want to mention that the entire protest against uh, Deb Spalding's announcement was organized on Facebook, and <laughs> as an example. Yeah, but that, those protests on on Facebook, I wouldn't deny that this kind of a thing. Uh, contributes to notifying people about protests, but there were also physical protests about Jeff Spaulding with cars, if you remember on Monday. Yeah, that yeah. was a morning. That's true, but there were also there were a hundred letters yeah. and comments yeah, in the Montigger. I know. About yeah. the article. It was amazing. No, it's just not enough. People still have to be able to gather, to protest, yeah, and to assemble. You but, just have to have that, or first of all, that's the basis of democracy, anyway. You but don't Sandy, have it, you uh, I'm, I'm going to have politics. Yeah, I'm going to add to Mark's point. I mean, the younger generation. I mean, you know, people in their teens and twenties. Yeah, right. And Jared, and Jared. Uh, I mean, he, he just turned thirty-nine. Well, yeah, but but look he at his so look at his haircut, though. I know it. It's it's nineteen. He's a nineteen-year-old. Uh, well, we but, know that about Jared. No, but I mean. The trend amongst you know people in their late teens and early twenties is towards being more in the home anyway. They're not as out and about as some of us older folks are. A lot of the work that they do, you know, even if they're not writers or publishers, is pretty much at home. Their social lives are conducted largely from their homes. That's a criticism that people have of millennials that they have these cyber existences, but that is kind of becoming a trend more and more, more anyway, regardless of uh, COVID-19. Can I just make one comment? They're not at their homes, they're in their parents' homes. <laughs> right, okay. Or, or grand, uh, 
parents' homes. Okay. But also, but that, but Noted. I, but that isn't really also totally right either because many of them are in the service industry and they are waiters and waitresses and they're in the gig economy and they have one gig here and one gig. It's not true that they're at home in general. I don't think they have lousy jobs. I'm, I'm just saying that there, there's a trend. There's what? a trend towards it. It's yeah. you know, not, not, this not is sped it up immensely. This is sped it yeah. up. Kurt's absolutely right. There's a trend toward it. And this is, this is sped it up. I mean, I see it in my, in yeah. my teaching, uh, all of the students have moved online and I think a lot of them are, we were already moving towards that at Vermont Law School, and a lot of them are going to demand that uh, moving forward COVID-19 or not, because that was the, where things were headed, and this just forced the, forced the issue. Right. Well, I think we can do, I think that it makes, I think we can do a lot online, and I think younger people are going to be able to, but on the other hand, it's going to create a real, um, division between people who have access to this and don't. I mean, I think about the um, action at the city council a couple of months yeah. ago with the um, farm workers, take, you know, coming to city hall and they they have no access to anything like this. Right, right. And they, they gather, they get together right. and it's a very active at the Migrant Justice Center. It's their, li it's their lifeline. So I don't think we should, we can't do it online, but I think we also really have to think about how those folks are gonna be able to participate. Yeah, I mean, Beth, there's certainly a class divide. You know, <laughs> folks that you would call blue collar, you know, who actually have to use their hands still in the modern world to work, uh, they're not gonna be in the same position as a writer or a lawyer or someone who can do a lot of their work virtually. So yeah. there's going to be that friction. Yeah. But it's not necessarily friction. All that I was saying, trying to, the point that I was trying to make is in as much as we are yeah. constrained now, the task falls upon us to develop a politics that can exist and uh, manifest within that constraint. That, that we're not being deprived of politics we are being offered an opportunity to figure new ways, this being one of them. Well, no, I couldn't agree more, but and that is what I'm trying to do. And I, actually, I do think we have to think about building an opposition still. And um, that's why I think it's so important that we continue things like this, frankly. But anyway, it's, it's tough to build people who really are less than, I think people are in general pretty hopeless, mm -hmm. which bothers me. Um, and so I guess I continue to try to do these uh, Zoom meetings in order to keep up hope that we can still form some kind of a camaraderie, I guess, that will be a true opposition, that's all. And in line with that, by the way, next week is, well, Robin wants to say something. Go ahead, Robin. Well, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I want to say, is that next week is an interesting uh, discussion, the state of community media, public access TV, and the possibility of democracy. Uh, and uh, Megan, Megan O'Rourke will be speaking, I believe, right? Yeah. We'll be on the call, and I'd like to introduce what... Um, Wilf Disarm is planning, which is we have, we're, we're going to have a, uh, uh, what we call a history and activism uh, rolling seminar where we look at exactly this year, 75 years ago, it's the 75th anniversary of the dropping of the bomb, but it's also the 75th anniversary of the creation of the United Nations. So that, you know, that, so that right after World War II, those two uh, really so such important paths were developed for civilization to go forward, either either um, cooperation or domination, and they're with us still today. So we're going to have some Zoom calls uh, with, um, for example, Phyllis Bennis about the formation of the United Nations, which happened uh, about. Uh, in a week or two, 75 years ago, and, um, and other events um, during the year. And so this is a way we're trying to respond to what Mark is saying. We have to devise sort of new 
techniques to communicate to people. Uh, so that one, and also the last one of uh, the this semester, uh, Burlington College and the Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement of Phoenix Rising. Uh, we need to, I mean, and people need to think of individuals to invite to that uh, to that session who can bring new ideas in some of the people who were involved in in the schools that might be uh, were proposed to be closing to to get their ideas um, to start circulating circulating ideas yeah we have to think of new ways alternate ways of education we really do and that's what this originally started as as a way to make Vicky into more of an educational institution I think Anyway, so anybody have any further thought? What's Jared laughing at? Hey, I'm, Jared. I'm just, I've got I've got a secondary conversation with a friend texting me, uh, sending me silly videos that I, I wouldn't want to share with you. All right. <laughs> okay. Any? Oh, come on. Any uh, that'd be another forum. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, the, just talking of education. Education. None. None of us. I think. Well, maybe uh, I'm wrong have young children in the house. Yeah, Jared yeah. does. You do, okay. Well, so to have the responsibility to educate children now in your home is an enormous field of endeavor and social change. And I think that in addition to stuff like this, which is all like gray hairs, you know, except for Jared. Uh, also, Kurt doesn't have gray hair. Yeah. Um, but largely gray hairs. There is a, a world of this material to, to deal with for people with children at home who that now have to take on the responsibility of either or both uh, educating them or enabling, facilitating their use of online uh, resources. So we can't see that here. We don't see the little kids here. We don't see the teenagers here. But they're there, and that's a big, that's a big job for it, for this job. Yeah. Does everybody think this is permanent? No. I don't. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Can't be. Can't be. No. no. I think things are going to be fundamentally shifted, but I don't think it's permanent. Yeah. You think the economy is going to recover? Uh, I, that's a good question. I'll defer to the economists in the group. I don't know who's the economist. Anyway. I, I, thought, you, I thought you were, Sandy. No, 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 no. I, I think I, I mean, I've, I've read the economists, some of them. Yeah, including, you know, I've read Marx and Hayek mm -hmm. and other libertarians, actually. Anyway. Okay. Any other, any Jack, other? a question? I, I, just, I just wanted to say to that last comment that, that um, if, if you see um, a direct link between the viral problem that we're in right now and global warming, then the answer is yes, it's definitely with us and it's gonna be with us for a long time. And, and the more we see that connection, the more likely we are to, um, I hope, uh, treat both of them with the, uh, with the wisdom that they uh, require for solving. I mean, that, that might, you know, I, I, as a final comment for me, I guess, is that I might, I might even agree with you. I don't think that the shutdown, though, uh, is the proper response, I guess. I wish we hadn't done that. Well, oil, oil demand is certainly down. I know. Yeah, oil demand really. is down, right. <laughs> right. And, pollu and pollution levels are down in most uh, <laughs> major cities around the world. Agree, but people are hurting. Yeah. Yeah. Really economically, it is really not a feasible situation. Okay, well, anyway, so next week we'll be discussing, talking about, because I think also that public access TV is a really educational tool that really should be used. I've not figured out why Lauren Glenn shut down the studio during this period of time. Well, we're doing it here without the studio. Um, I, that ha I, it has not been out to the public though without the studio. But it can be because Mark, Mark, it's Mark, been recorded. Mark. Okay, Mark, we did it. We have done that. We did I it know, last so week. So all yeah. I'm saying is that uh, is that the shutting down of the studio does not stop 
the function of the of uh, community resource. We demand that it be open. It is the media, and that the media is essential service. They never had the any reason to shut it down, and I could tell. But anyway, that's a different discussion. But we'll be talking about that next week. And then the week after that, I think it'd be great if all of you joined, particularly the week after that, because we are going to be talking about new educational models based sort of on the Burlington College model many years ago. So, and many of us were involved in that. Jared, Kurt, all of us were involved in Burlington College, right? At one point or another, weren't we? Anyway. Yeah, and I was 10 years teaching at Goddard, which yes. to me is a enormously important model what happened to goddard is it there still or what What's yes it is uh -huh. yeah okay that would be interesting to hear from mark yeah yeah okay all right so thank you all for being here oh,